The text for the sermon this morning is 2 Samuel 6, verse 7. We'll read that verse again. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, at certain times, our God deemed it necessary to remind his people that he is the holy God who lives among them. And he had to remind them of that not only in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. And you have to think of the new, the young Christian church in Jerusalem right after Pentecost, where the believers were of one heart and soul, as it says in Acts. But then Ananias fell dead at the apostle Peter's feet and later also his wife because they lied about the gift they had made for the church. They wanted to make themselves look good before all, glorify themselves in the presence of all, and they forgot who God is. You see, the Lord God brings sinners to his church, even the greatest sinners. But those who are brought into his church and covenant have to remember that they're only gathered to his church and covenant and saved by his grace. And wherever God gathers people to himself and his grace, it's of utmost importance that those people then remember that they belong to and worship a holy and awesome God. No one should take him for granted or worship him or call upon him or open his word except with reverence. And then he also has revealed in his word that he wants to be worshiped according to that word. And that counts for to us today too. Our text warns us today that we are to worship and walk with our God in humble obedience to his word and in deep reverence for his holiness. And with that in mind, let's listen to our text this morning with, with this theme, By Means of the Ark, God reminds us to worship him with obedience and reverence. We consider three things, David and the Ark, secondly, Uzzah and the Ark, and thirdly, Jesus Christ and the Ark. First of all, David and the Ark. What, congregation, what happened then in the text centered around, it, it, it all centered around the Ark, what happened there. You know what the ark was, a wonderful wooden chest with special lid all covered with pure gold. The Lord God had commanded Moses to make that ark when he renewed the covenant with the people at Mount Sinai. And that's also why it's called the Ark of the Covenant. It contained the two stone tables inscribed with the 10 words of the covenant. We heard them earlier this morning. The pure gold lid of the ark called the mercy seat. We don't know exactly what it looked like, but it was called the mercy seat. And that's where the blood was sprinkled on the day of atonement when the high priest made atonement for the sins of the whole nation of Israel. And above the mercy seat were these two gold angels looking down on the mercy seat and attached to the sides of the ark were four rings for long poles, which we'll touch on later on. The Ark of the Covenant signified in, to, to the, the Israelites that God lived among them, among his people, by means of that blood of atonement on that mercy seat. The Ark showed that God had chosen Israel in order to save them and to be worshipped and served by them. Well, hundreds of years later, the ark was still around. And David, the king of Israel, wanted to bring the ark into Israel's capital, 
city, Jerusalem. For 70 years it had been stored in a house in Kiriath Jearim, a village in the mountains about 20 kilometers west of Jerusalem. In other words, in hilly and inhospitable country, away from what was the center of Israel, the Jerusalem. But now God wanted the ark, the sign of God's, uh, David wanted the ark, the sign of God's present, presence brought into the capital city of Israel to be among the people, make it available to the people, accessible to the nation. D David wanted to restore the ark of God to the people so they could know and see that God lived among them through the atoning work of the priests. O oh, congregation, in bringing the ark to Jerusalem, we can assume that David had really good intentions. But God is holy, and he is not served and worshipped with our good intentions as such. We can presume that what we're doing in worship will please God, but he isn't honored in his holiness by what we ourselves might think or feel is fine with him, or we believe honors him. No. No matter who we are or what we have experienced or how old we are, our thoughts and feelings about serving and worshiping our God cannot be the measure of our worship and honor of our God. His word and his law are the measure of what he wants from us and what pleases him. Think of the songs which have been proposed to be added to the book of praise and need to be tested, as we did this morning earlier. The ultimate measure of suitable songs for worship in the churches is not how moving or how well put together they are. The ultimate measure is how scriptural and reverent they are. Back to King David. He and all Israel with him then we're all excited and joyful about bringing the ark to Jerusalem. It was a whole big procession of excited and singing and dancing people which accompanied the ark up toward the city. David presumed that he knew God well enough to know that God would be better worshipped with the ark central in Jerusalem. Good thought. But David neglected to investigate from God's word how that ought to be done in a way that was pleasing to God and honored God. He presumed God would, would be happy with what he had organized himself. But then the Lord God stopped that whole parade, transporting the ark to Jerusalem in its tracks just outside the city. He struck Uzzah dead beside the ark, and with that God showed his anger to King David and to the nation about what was happening here with the ark of God. What was wrong? Well, if you pay attention to the verses 12 to 15, which we also read, and they describe how the ark was successfully brought into Jerusalem three months later, you see two things are different from the first attempt. In the first place, you see that instead of the ark being transported on a cart as the first time, it was now being carried by priests. Those rings you see on the side of the ark were for poles so that the priests could carry the ark on their shoulders. And that's what the Lord God had commanded already through Moses. We read about that in Numbers 4. Nobody was to touch the ark or even look on it. It had to be covered. It was only to be carried by consecrated priests on poles on their shoulders. It was holy. It was a holy symbol of his merciful presence among his people. David, however, presumed that he knew that this would be a good way to transport the ark. And in that, he did not uphold God as holy in the presence of the Lord himself and in the presence of the people. And there's the second thing that went differently the second time the ark was being taken to Jerusalem. When those who carried the ark of the Lord had only gone a few steps the second time, then it says that David sacrificed, made 
offerings. Those were guilt offerings and thank offerings to the Lord as per the law of Moses. And with the sacrifice of the ox, Israel confessed guilt for all the years that the ark had been ignored in Kiriath Jearim. And with the offering of the fatted animal, they expressed thankfulness for God's presence and their intent to honor him and everything. And those sacrifices were not offered the first time the ark was transported. David had presumed they were not needed when transporting the ark. And he, again, did not acknowledge God as holy when he didn't bring those offerings. So David had good intentions, but he forgot that God is holy. He forgot who he's dealing with, that God is holy and only wants to be worshipped and served as he himself has made known in his word. And then you can think here of, of King Saul before David. What the Lord had said to Saul through Samuel some years before, Saul had not destroyed all the animals of the Amalekites as the Lord had commanded him. And then Samuel came there and he saw all the animals and Saul said he had kept the best of them to sacrifice to the Lord alive. But Samuel said to him, 1 Samuel 15, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Think about that. Presumption as iniquity and idolatry even. And that's what David was doing. He presumed that things would be fine with God. What's, he presumed to, to know what's good for God. And our text shows us that our holy God is angered if we decide to worship and serve him as we ourselves think is fine. If we feel that he is honored by this or that, as it suit, or as it suits us, makes us feel good. Participate in worship only when we feel like it. Deal with our baptism as it suits us. Good to be baptized, but I'll live as I want. Or deal with the Lord's Supper lightly. No self-examination. If we, if we can't eat and drink judgment on ourselves at the Lord's Supper. The sin of presumption and self-willed worship. Congregation, our holy and gracious God isn't honored by our good intentions and feelings. He has made known to us in his word how he wants to be worshipped and served, and that's how we need to worship him then too. Otherwise, what we do, even with the best of intentions, will not honor him, will not please him. He wants to be acknowledged as holy by his people. And he wants to be acknowledged as holy by our submission to his word. Nowadays, a lot of evangelical churches do their utmost to make worship user-friendly, emotionally uplifting, seeker welcome. But worship is not ultimately about the people feeling good and their feelings. It's, it's about Worshiping our holy God as pleases him and honors him. In other words, according to his word with reverence. And that's what reformed worship is about. We come to the second part of the sermon. Uzzah and the ark. So David, King David, ordered the ark to be taken from Kiriath Jearim to Jerusalem. It had been there for 70 years, as we mentioned. You remember, though, that in the days of Eli, the high priest, the Philistines had captured the Ark of God. But then they took it to various cities, and the cities were all struck by plagues. And they were, the, the Philistines were afraid of it, so they decided to return the Ark to Israel. And they sent it to Beth Shemesh on a cart drawn by two cows. Then what happened was the men of Beth Shemesh 
were curious and looked into the ark, and the Lord God struck 70 of those men dead. And you can imagine the shock of the people. They were so alarmed that they brought the ark to the house of the Levite Abinadab in Kiriath Jearim, and they left it there. And that all happened 70 years before our text. Now, 70 years for us today would be uh, back in 1951 or so. Or 52. A, a church can forget some of its history after 70 years. Witness our former sister churches in the Netherlands who have approved female office bearers and are working towards same-sex marriage. Or maybe the, the people in King David's days had vaguely heard something about what had happened in Beth Shemus 70 years before. But apparently it did not make much impression on them anymore. The ark was on its way to Jerusalem in a new cart drawn by oxen, maybe even in imitation of how the pagan Philistines had transported the ark to Israel in the first place. The sons of Abinadab, Uzzah, and Ahil were in charge, makes th sure things were going good with the transportation, all kinds of musical instruments played, the people sang, they made merry, it says. Then one of the oxen stumbled, and the ark probably slid, slid sideways on the cart. And it says that Uzzah put his hand on the ark. The Hebrew words used, verse 6, for putting his hand on the ark indicate that Uzzah didn't just touch the ark lightly. No, he grabbed hold of it. And it says in our text, the anger of the Lord was kindled, and God struck Uzzah down because of his error, and he died beside the ark of God. And you might wonder about that. Why did the Lord find it necessary to strike the man dead in the middle of that festive bringing of the ark into Jerusalem? What else could he have done when he was afraid that it was going to slide off the cart? Shouldn't his action rather have been praised? What if the ark had slid off the cart and fallen onto the ground? Wouldn't that have been worse? But note that the text says the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah because of his error, his transgression, Uzzah sinned when he grabbed hold of the ark of the Lord. And what was his sin? Thoughtlessness, congregation. He was not thinking of what he was doing. He had not considered the holiness of God and what God had commanded about the ark. No one was to touch it not even the priests, because it represented his throne, his holy presence among his people. Uzzah maybe had the best in mind for the ark itself. He probably did. He didn't want it damaged, but he caused the anger of the Lord to be kindled against him when he reacted without thinking, without considering the holiness of the ark there on that cart and the holiness of God himself. And by striking Uzzah down at the time, God sadly had to remind David and all the people again that he is holy. They have to do with a holy and exalted God. And so our text also then shines a light on how we treat what is holy to God today. When we participate in worship on God's holy day and his holy word is opened and the holy sacraments are administered, does the wonder that we may meet with the most high and holy God and hear his word and take part in the sacraments and praise his holy name, does that enter our hearts and minds, congregation? Did it enter yours this morning? Is there humble reverence? Do we think, what a wonder that the holy and eternal God above this universe speaks to me in his word and has called me to be his child and sealed that to me with baptism, invites me to his table of salvation, seeks my worship? Because who am I? 
conceived and born in sin as everyone else in this world, sinful and guilty of sin in myself by nature. I fit with and belong to the evil one. And what a miracle that for the sake of Christ, God wants me for himself, calls me, and I can come to him in worship, And that I can and even want to sing praise to him, give thank offerings to him when the deacons come with the collection bag. If that sense of wonder and reverence isn't in all of us, brothers and sisters, young people, boys and girls, and if we find it ho-hum to come here and sit here in church and participate in the worship and service of our holy God, and we do that thoughtlessly, even if we sit here, we do that thoughtlessly, then our text shows us clearly this is sin before God. Then I upset and anger him if I listen with boredom as his holy law is read, sit with my thoughts elsewhere when his word is open, maybe thinking about what I'm going to do afterwards or after the service or, or later on this week or thinking about my business while his holy word is opened. And if I sing thoughtlessly, pass the collection bag on uncaringly, what kind of attitude does that show towards God who created the universe, who created us out of the dust, who sent his only son to save us poor sinners from eternal damnation. And maybe as far as attitude of reverence toward God, I could also mention how we come to church, how we dress, and how we prepare for church. Congregation in worship, we meet with our holy and almighty and eternal creator and redeemer. And then we should remember Uzzah, who was struck down because of thoughtlessness, irreverence for God's holiness. We can so easily also fall into that sin which caused God's anger to be killed at that time. Maybe that's even why the Lord caused our Sunday worship to be interrupted over the past two years. Just to make us mindful of those things. Who are we worshiping? So let us be mindful and show reverence for God's holiness as we worship him. Also, as we open his word at home, boys and girls, do you listen carefully to the holy word of God? We come to the last part of the sermon, Jesus Christ in the ark. In the text, God visibly and clearly showed his anger against David's sin of presumption and Uzzah's sin of thoughtlessness and irreverence. But do you know when and where God's anger burned with even much more intensity, even fully. The form for celebration of the Lord's Supper, we've heard it so often. It says so plainly and clearly in the part about self-examination, for the wrath of God against sin is so great that he could not leave it unpunished, but has punished it in his beloved son, Jesus Christ, by the bitter and shameful death on the cross. Congregation, our holy God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all and struck down his only son, had his blood poured out for us on the cross, focused all his wrath on him. And he was the once-for-all fulfillment of that holy symbol of the ark and that mercy seat with all the blood poured on it. The cross shows us how great God's wrath against our sins are, is. And at the same time, the cross also shows how great his love is for us. He gave his son to make atonement for poor sinners like us with his blood and with his descent into hell. And through his son, God holds out salvation from eternal death to us in his word, holy word, and the holy sacraments. 
abundant forgiveness of all our sins. Also, our sins of presumptuousness and thoughtlessness and of self-willed worship and irreverence. And now you might think it. Maybe, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be safer just to stay away from church and, and stay away from worship if it's so dangerous to deal with this God and His holiness? If God's anger can be kindled against that presumptuousness and thoughtlessness which we fall into so easily, wouldn't it be better maybe just to stay away? If David had just left the ark where it was and us ahead and walked beside the ark to make sure everything went well, God's anger wouldn't have been kindled against them, would it? So if we stay away from God's holy word and worship, wouldn't that be safer for us too? Congregation, nothing could be more presumptuous and disrespectful and irreverent than having nothing to do with God and his worship. You can think of the holy things of God as something like electrical power. Electricity is extremely beneficial for us, right? How many things don't run on electricity today? Appliances, machines, lately also a lot of cars. Electric power enriches our lives in so many ways. What would you do without it today? But no matter how beneficial it is, if you handle it wrongly, if you connect wires in a wrong way, or you leave wires uncovered and carelessly touch them, that power can cause death. That can happen. That's a reality. It's not the purpose of that power. But if you misuse it, that's what happens. While well, the preaching of the Holy Gospel and the signifying and sealing of it in the sacraments and the whole worship of God on Sundays is like electrical power, congregation. It can kindle God's anger against you, bring condemnation on you if you don't deal with it rightly. But that's not the purpose of worship here. The purpose is to give you peace and blessing, abundant forgiveness of all your sins through God's mercy in Jesus Christ, also, forgiveness for the sins of presumption and thoughtlessness and irreverence is held out here. The worship here is all about the great mercy and love of God for sinners like me and you in Christ. And so that we might live with God in his glory and holiness now and forever. Congregation, if you, you truly see that, then it cannot be but you'll want to participate in worship with as much reverence and attention as possible. And then by the working of the Holy Spirit, you'll also more and more grow in your love for the Almighty and Holy God and the Savior in your desire to live soberly and reverently according to His Word. You want to do that. And it'll become harder and harder for you to commit those sins of presumption and thoughtlessness because you'll more and more hate those sins and flee from them. That's the goal of worship, to grow in humble reverence to our holy God and in submission to him and in love for his worship on his holy day and to be empowered by the Spirit of Christ to live for him all the days of our lives. Amen.